Um, so before we kind of get started, for those of you guys uh, who have uh, sat through one of our little presentations before, uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat at any point throughout the presentation. And at the very end, I'll open it up to just any kind of question you've got. So whether it's even camera related stuff or video related stuff, if it has nothing to do with pet photography, totally fine. Um, but yeah, so we'll just kind of get rolling here. Uh, so I had kind of put together a whole presentation and then as I was going through it initially, I thought, eh, let's switch this up a little bit. So we're going to tackle some of the camera settings and things like that that you'd want to set to achieve different looks, different styles of uh, shooting. And then we'll kind of tackle a couple different tips, uh, more working with the animals to get the most out of them as you're, as you're photographing as well. Uh, just to make sure everyone's chat is working, uh, what are you guys doing currently in pet photography? Are you guys here photographing your own pets, just trying to get some better, better images of them? Are you trying to pursue professional work in the pet industry? What are your guys' uh, what are you guys trying to get as a takeaway today? Okay, so some professional, some of our own. Family and friends, perfect, perfect. Just here to learn, I like that too. So uh, I'll tackle this in kind of two regards as we go. Uh, one of it will be more just, you know, how I went about this and how I kind of improved some of my skills, but then also the avenues you can pursue if you want it to be more than just photographing your own pets or your friend's pets. Uh, but we'll kind of tackle that a little bit later here too. So jumping into our first part, uh, there we go. So we'll get into some of the camera settings. Uh, so those of you who have uh, listened to me lecture before, I am a big fan of keeping the camera more in manual, especially as we get into the mirrorless camera. And the main reason there is that I get to see everything the camera sees right away. Uh, so when I'm shooting manual, it gives me more creative controls. I get to set my shutter speeds, my apertures, uh, and I don't really have to babysit the exposure quite as much as I used to in a digital SLR camera. Uh, so for almost all of my shooting, I'm typically in manual. I will lock in an aperture based on how much depth of field I want. I'll lock in a shutter speed based on if I'm trying to show movement or freeze action. And a lot of times I'll leave the ISO set to auto and I will kind of predetermine a range that I want it to work within. Uh, so most times that's going to be, at least on the modern cameras, on the current cameras, uh, that's going to be somewhere between about 100 ISO on the low side and probably upwards of 10,000 ISO on the high side. All right, so let's take a look at shutter speeds here. So there's two theories with shutter speed when we're photographing pets. Uh, one is like this image where I want a fast shutter speed. I'm at about a thousandth of a second uh, or even a little faster on this one. Uh, and you can see everything is frozen, right? Like their posture's frozen. All the snow they're kicking up behind them is frozen in place as well. And this little guy was cruising. So a very fast shutter speed is going to help me lock them in place. And again, this is a balancing act in the camera. So I'm picking, as you can look at that background that's there, it's pretty diffused, pretty distorted as well. So it's a pretty shallow uh, aperture that I'm using. I want to say I was probably only like a 5.6 aperture on here, uh, which is enough depth of field that the pet is pretty much all in focus uh, from the backside of the ears to the front hip kind of thing. Like it's all pretty sharp but it's enough diffusion that that background kind of the way and doesn't distract. The other thing we can do, something like this shows the speed of the animal as they're kind of frozen, have that snow kicking up. But in summertime, you don't really get that same atmosphere added to the image. So you have to kind of work around that. 
The way to go around that is to actually slow my shutter speed down a little bit. And as I do that, I'm gonna pan with the animal. So on this one, I think I was at like maybe a 60th of a second, maybe even a little slower than that. And as she's running through the little uh, backyard area there, I'm just panning with her and shooting. And because we're moving at the same speed or relatively at the same speed, her face and everything like that is still nice and sharp. But that background is a blur, making it look like she's moving quite a bit faster. Uh, the same technique works really well if you're photographing kids, like riding their bike, things like that. You can add a lot more excitement to the photo, a lot more movement to the photo uh, without them necessarily going any faster. So, Shutter speeds, I would say it all really depends on the look. In most cases, we're probably going to be somewhere in the higher shutter speeds because a lot of times we're trying to freeze action uh, on the subject, unless it's something like this where, you know, maybe it's a dog who does a lot of uh, relay racing or obstacle racing, uh, agility course racing kind of stuff. And I want to really show that speed that they move at then I can shoot with a slower shutter speed and pan the subject. Uh, this one is actually not with the animal IAF. This was taken on an A7 III, I want to say, uh, maybe A9, but this was uh, before that feature came out. So this was actually just more luck, kind of more hoping that the focus points would stay where I needed them to. Uh, to hedge my bet a little bit on that, again, I'll, even though I have lenses that are capable of shooting a nice shallow depth of field, like a 2.8 aperture, a lot of times for pets, I won't shoot that. Um, a lot of times I'll shoot at a 5.6 aperture or an F8, which kind of leads us right into our next place here, uh, as we're going to talk about apertures. So depth of field. So two schools of thought here. If I have a busy cluttered background that's not going to add a whole lot to the photo, then I want to shoot a narrow, narrow depth of field. Uh, so this uh, was with the 24 millimeter 1.4, and this is at 1.4. And this is actually back, this is actually when Animal IAF was out and I was using it. But you can see how narrow that focus is just by looking at the carpet, and you can see how almost right at the front of her muzzle, it's out of focus. And then basically just past where her eyes are is out of focus as well. So everything's a blur that's not in that small, small little swatch of focus. This is only maybe super usable if the animal's staying still. So if they're sitting, if they're laying, if they're kind of working with us a little bit, uh, then I can get away with shooting those real narrow apertures. The problem that we'll run into is you can see her nose is already out of focus, but her eyes are sharp. So with, oh, I see someone brought their pet to the class too. Uh, so without animal eye out of focus uh, or without being super on top of my focus, it's very possible for me to have a nose in focus and the eyes are stopped. And we want to avoid that as well. So a lot of times we're aiming for those eyes to be sharp. And the easiest way to do that to give ourselves more depth of field. So using a larger aperture, something like a 5.6, maybe an F8. So another example. So on here we can see eyes are sharp all the way up to the nose is sharp. Uh, even that big old tongue is sharp. And this is just using a bigger aperture. Uh, so this was actually, and you'll see a few different images throughout here. Um, that are from this place. This was actually a doggy daycare that I photographed for. So they had a whole bunch of their regulars in uh, and I came in and photographed for them uh, so that they would have some stuff that they could provide for their patrons as kind of an extra perk for them. Uh, so just wanted to make sure that I had everything front to back as much as possible. Uh, so big aperture to give me that extra room to work with. The other thing that we'll probably run into. So with the pets you guys have, uh, are they all one solid color? Do you have multiple colors or spots or any of that on your animals that you're working with? Is 
can feel free to type your answer in chat here. Multiple colors. So with animals that are kind of multiple colored, uh, it's a little easier to focus on them. Uh, if I have an animal that's like a solid white or a solid black, it becomes much more difficult uh, to focus on them just because we have a lack of contrast. And so if we jump into some focus settings here, and this is going to be a little bit more relevant to Sony cameras. Uh, let's wake up this guy. I'll pop up. There we go. So this will be a little bit more relevant to Sony cameras, but what I like to use for my focus area, hang on, I'm just gonna put this on so you guys don't get a roller coaster ride as we walk through the menu here. But what I like to do for my focus area, so if we hit the function button on the back, brings up that little function menu. My focus mode, I'm going to want to keep as, oops, let me move this out of the way here. I'll usually keep this as AFC, so it's continuous autofocus. So as long as I'm holding halfway down, the camera's gonna keep refocusing. And then in my focus area, I'll now have this tracking or lock-on option available. And you'll see if I press left and right, I can toggle between any of the other focus areas with that lock or that focus lock capability. The one I really like to use for animals in general uh, is going to be this expanded flexible spot. And you'll see that it's got kind of two brackets or two squares there. So the center one's going to be the initial focus point it's looking for. And then it's going to use a cluster of focus points around that. So if I have a solid black dog or a solid white dog, something with very little contrast, it can use those supporting points to actually help anchor and help hold focus. So it's a lot more accurate, a lot uh, more solid for focus using that expanded flexible spot. And then the tracking just makes it so that as I'm locked onto the animal, as they start moving throughout the frame, that focusing will follow them in the frame. So that's the biggest piece that I use for focus settings. The other thing that we run into a lot with, with our animals here, oops, we gotta reset this. There we go. So the other problem that we run into with the animals is uh, exposure. And so when we get two animals like these two guys who are black labs, uh, it's really tough for the camera to figure out what I'm trying to expose. And more times than not, the camera is actually going to want to brighten up the image on these kind of guys just to help bring up that uh, exposure or get it back to more of a neutral gray exposure. So what we need to actually do is use their exposure comp on the camera. So if you have like an A7 series camera, you have that wheel up on the top of the camera with the plus one, minus one, minus whatnot. Yep, and we want to move it to the minus side. So we want to start reducing light or darkening that image to get it back. If we have an A6000 series camera, that little thumb pad on the back of the camera, if you press down on that, it'll bring up your exposure comp, and then you can adjust that as well. But yeah, with these guys, it's going to want to brighten the image more so than it really needs to. And so I can make that adjustment with exposure comp. With all that being said, if I'm shooting manual, I'm going to be completely in control of that exposure anyway. So I'll be able to see it ahead of time. But that auto ISO is going to start boosting that ISO up higher so that it can expose for a more neutral gray. So when I start doing my exposure comp, it's actually just going to end up reducing my ISO. So 
so I don't have to worry about my shutter speeds changing or anything like that. On the flip side, if I had an all white dog, it actually might start darkening the image, again, trying to bring them back to a neutral gray. So that's when I have to use my exposure comp and move it towards the plus side, and I need to brighten it. Got a little glitchy there. All right. Uh, yeah, so if you're shooting in raw, you have a lot more exposure latitude in the file. Uh, so it's definitely capable of adjusting your shadows, adjusting your highlights uh, in general. Uh, with a raw file, you'll have a lot more capability there. Just depends if you want to do it on the computer or if you just want it to come straight out of the camera ready to go. It's more personal preference in that regard. Uh, some people love the whole editing process and they love putting in the work on the photos on the computer. More power to you. Uh, a lot of times I've gotten to the point where if I don't need to spend the time on the computer with the photos, I'm happier that way. Um, so if I can avoid it, I will. If I can't, then I'll shoot and run. I know that. Yeah, you've got that recovery later. I'd say on a lot of the current generation of cameras, uh, amongst all brands, on the low side, you've probably got 10 stops of latitude either way. On the high side with some of the newer cameras out there, you've got about 15 stops of latitude in that exposure that you can correct for. So, so quite a bit that you can correct for if you don't get exposure right. Or if you have a tricky shot like two black dogs on the snow or something like that, where I'm trying to balance everything. Cool, so we'll jump into some tips here. Um, so the first one is gonna be more so if I'm going and I'm shooting for friends or I'm shooting for a client. And that tip is to acclimate. So when we first go and visit someone's pet, I need to give them time to warm up to me. I need to give them time to be okay with me in their domain. So this is going to be me showing up, me taking out my equipment, setting it out on the floor so they can walk up and sniff it and smell it and see what it is and know that they don't have to be scared of anything. Uh, so if you're going into some of those photo shoots, Honestly, budget like 20 to 30 minutes of just kind of sitting there, letting the animal kind of get friendly with you, get comfortable with you. Uh, if the owner has some treats that are okay for the pet, bring some of that stuff to build goodwill, good rapport between you and the animal. Uh, it's just going to help you out in the end. Because uh, I've done it the other way where, you know, some of the first shoots I went into, I went in, started setting up and we were going to shoot and the dog didn't want anything to do with me and it took a lot longer once you start setting up light stands and things like that. Uh, so let's go in, just play with the dog for that first 20 minutes. They'll warm up to you, they'll be happy with you. The trickiest one I probably had uh, when I was shooting for the doggy daycare is we kind of had a budgeted like 20 minute cycle that they were going to bring out a bunch of the different animals and one of them was super timid. And so it was probably like that last five minutes of the shoot is when we actually shot. Other than that, it was me sitting there with some treats trying to get them to even come over and sniff me. So you gotta acclimate, gotta let them know you're okay. The next one is more so for your pet. So if it's your animal, we wanna work on desensing them. So the more I can have that camera around them, the more I can get up in their face with the camera, things like that, the less they care. Uh, the less they worry about it, the less it's unusual or something out of the ordinary. Uh, a lot of it honestly is to the point now where with our own pet, we can put phones or cameras or whatever right in her face. She doesn't really care. She'll give us a look for a minute or so, but then she goes away. The other thing, speaking of that, is if you have the ability to have like a pivot screen on your camera, so instead of using your viewfinder, you're using that back screen on the camera, that is a much better way to shoot uh, for pets because it allows them to still see your face and still engage with you, 
and you can still see what you're doing in shoot. So more times than not, using that back screen is the go-to way. Uh, but with anything with your pets, uh, desensing them, getting them comfortable with the equipment. Do any of you guys use lighting or are you just using available lighting? Available. Available lighting. If you use any kind of lighting that you're gonna put up on light stands, uh, honestly, bring out the light stand, set them up, put them in the room like the day before you're gonna wanna shoot. That way they can walk in, they can see them, they're gonna be timid and scared of them to begin with, but the more they see it just sitting in the room, the more they recognize it as not a bad thing, that it's not doing anything, it's just sitting there. Um, if you do decide to use lights, I wouldn't use studio strobes. Uh, the pulse of light tends to freak them out, uh, but then also that kind of recycle pop that the lights make is kind of a scary thing for the pets as well. So if you can get constant lights, uh, you know, LED panel lights, things like that, uh, it'll make your job a lot easier. The pet won't get freaked out about it either. So, And same with newborns too, babies and pets. Uh, keep calm is the other big tip that I usually give. Um, same thing when we photograph children. Uh, pets can read all of that body language you don't think you're saying. So every bit of frustration comes across to them. They can read it. They now know that this is not a fun thing, that this is a stressful thing. They're going to get stressed. They're not going to want to be engaged or be a part of this either. So you just need to keep calm, keep your composure. You know, if the shot's not coming out the way you wanted it to, move on, come back, try it again. Uh, but don't get flustered, don't get anxious and things like that, because they'll read all of that body language, all of that nonverbal body language. And you guys probably hear me harp on this next one all the time, uh, but get low, get on their level. Uh, it's probably the one thing you can say for almost all the photos that I've shown you today is I've been shooting at their eye level on almost every single one of them. It's a more engaging photo when you're looking straight at their eyes as opposed to looking down on them. Uh, that being said, there are times where, uh, like our dog especially, she likes to sleep in these goofy positions uh, and she'll have her legs just everywhere. So a lot of times getting over top and shooting that or shooting different angles. Um, but if we're photographing, getting down on their eye level is a big thing. Focus on the details too. Um, so not only for your pet, but if I'm shooting for a client, this might be just a friend, this might be like a doggy daycare like this. There are bits and pieces of every pet, every animal that are very unique to them uh, from the very obvious, the one dog that's missing a leg, uh, to it might be certain spots or shooting their paws, things like that. Um, that I want to photograph. So focusing on those details, if I'm shooting for clients, a lot of times I will just in talking with them say, you know, what are the things that you really love about your dog? And sometimes, you know, it'll be something like, oh, you know, she's got these crazy ears when she's laying on the floor, her ears are laid out and they're just huge. Or, you know, she's got this heart shaped spot on her back. That's just so cool. All of that stuff. And it's just things for you to work with. Then you know, okay, these are some detail pieces I can capture, as well as general photos of the animal as well. Letting them play is also a big thing. Uh, so a lot of times with the session, you know, we spend that first 20 or 30 minutes just kind of getting them comfortable with me being there, me taking the pictures, that kind of stuff. I'll probably spend the next 20 minutes with my camera and playing with them. So if they will chase a ball or chase a stick, or if they do tricks and stuff like that, uh, having them do the tricks and I'll be shooting photos throughout that. This serves two purposes. Uh, one, you get some of these great engagement photos of them playing, them happy, them as much as the dog smiles, their dog smile. You get a lot of that coming through the camera as well. Uh, but it also starts to tire them out a little bit. 
So then that last 20, 30 minutes of your session, you have them relaxed, laying down, those kind of shots where they're gonna actually stay still for you a little bit. So the play session works two pieces, one for me to get some of those characteristic fun shots of them, and then also to wear them out for the later part. And then the final tip is you gotta reward your model. Uh, all of our pets are kind of the same way. They're on a reward system. When they do something good, they get a bonus, they get treats, they get a toy, they get playtime, they get something of that nature. So if we want them to be a part of these photo sessions with us, we need to reward them at the definitely at the end of it. But if we're asking for tricks and behaviors and stuff like that throughout the session, keep rewarding them as you're doing that as well. Especially if you grab some good photos, tell them, oh, good, and give them some treats. They'll want to keep repeating it so that they get more treats. That's just the way their minds work. A very reward-based system. Today was a very quick session for you guys, uh, as opposed to some of the other ones that we've done. So that's all I've got for you on the pet stuff. Do you guys have any questions or things that you wanted me to cover that I didn't get to? How many times does it take to get one good shot? Uh, uh, I mean, are you, are you so there's a lot of pictures? There's a lot of variables there. Um, you know, sometimes the lighting's just not good. Sometimes you get great lighting and then the animal's not interested. Um, but I would say even looking at our, our dog alone, I've probably shot comfortably 3,000. It's probably even a low number. 3,000 images of her over the last three years. Um, and of that, I would say that there's probably maybe 50 of them that I love. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of it is timing yeah. timing absolutely so a lot of times I'm shooting in a burst knowing that I'm going to probably throw away two-thirds of them at least yeah uh, but I'm shooting in a burst of photos and like this one with uh, our dog and the bone I shot probably 10 images and this is the one that I loved out of that that 10 round burst because she actually has like the smile in her eyes you can kind of see the happiness as she's chowing away on that. What, what uh, lens are you but, using for these? Uh, it's different on every single one of these shots, to be honest with you. Um, this one, I want to say, is probably like a 50 millimeter. Uh, a lot of times I like shooting with the fixed focal length because if I need to, and you can look at like the carpet again, is a really shallow depth of field. Mm -hmm. So if I'm shooting interior where I'm in a house, and I want to hide some of that background. I really like primes. Uh, mm -hmm. So whether it's a 50 millimeter, if I'm, and actually if we go back to this one, her nose, that's an RX100. That's a point and shoot camera. And I'm just up close photographing her nose to get all the little detail there. Um, something like this was a 70 to 200. So they're all different lenses. Uh, just kind of depends on the space I have to work with um, and really the energy level of the animal too. So sometimes zooms will work out better because I have that flexibility for a very mobile animal. You know, if it's an animal that really loves to run, really likes to move. Uh, and if they're a little bit more relaxed or if we're going to be indoors, a prime will work fine because I can usually pick out the focal length based on what room we have to work with. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so lens recommendations. If if I had to choose one lens to photograph pets with, if I had to choose two lenses to photograph pets with, it'd probably be a 2470, 70 to 200, or that variation of uh, lenses. You don't necessarily need the 28 versions. Like I said, a lot of times you're going to want to shoot it like a 5.6 aperture so that you have enough depth of field. Uh, but those, that focal range will allow you a lot more flexibility in shooting. Um, yeah, so the panning technique, uh, we're going to set a slower shutter speed. So for some of the dogs like this one of ours, she was maybe a year old at this point. 
uh, and she flies when she wants to run. She's insanely fast. Uh, so now I could probably even be at like a hundredth of a second and panning with her and I'll still have some of that background blur. If they move a little slower, we can go a little slower on the shutter speed. Um, but I just want to try and keep my, my pace of pan at the same pace they're moving, if that makes sense. So if I'm shooting, I want to try and keep them right in the center of the frame the whole time I'm shooting. But a 60th of a second to maybe a hundredth of a second, depending on the animal, uh, should be enough that you can get that background to blur, but they're still relatively sharp. Uh, so in a horse, yeah, horse arenas are tough because um, it is very dark all the time. Uh, so in that case, if you can go with, and you can't get that close. Um, so that's where you might even go with something like a 24 to 72 eight and be more at the 70 side of it. You can now do 2.8 so that you get the lighting into the camera or the light into the camera from the aperture. But because we're at a far enough distance, you're gonna have more depth of field there as well to work with. Um, it's all tough because some of the arenas are huge where even 70, you're a mile away, it feels like. And- um, I'm not that far, it's, but, mostly, it's mostly the light problem for me. And okay. Am I on manual? I mean, you're using continuous, right? Yep, yep. So we're using a burst of photo. Uh, so we're in a burst mode, but we're also in continuous autofocus. Okay. And then um, uh, I guess my problem is I'm trying to do this in shutter speed or, or aperture, but I should be in manual. Yeah. So if you're the problem that you'll run into is if you're in shutter priority and you pick your shutter speed, everything's just going to come out really dark. If yes. your lens can't give you that aperture. Yep. Um, and if you're an aperture priority, everything's going to come out really blurry if you can't get enough light in. Uh, so what I usually will do is I'll go into manual um, and I will set my aperture just to be, in this case for the arena, as bright as it can be. So if that's a 2.8 or an F4 or whatever that happens to be. Right. Um, set your ISO if you can run it in auto and run it from a hundred to wherever you're most comfortable with it on the top side. Okay. So that might be 6,400, that might be 10,000, wherever you're comfortable with that before it's too grainy for your liking. Right. And then I would start your shutter speed for horses. I'd probably start your shutter speed at like one eight hundredth of a second. You're going to probably want to even go up higher than that, but start there. Are you okay. on a mirrorless camera? Yeah, Sony A7. Okay. Um, so you should be able to see the exposure and everything live right there in the viewfinder. Okay. Um, and if you wanted to, you could take it a step further. You could even lock in your ISO. So if you don't want anything to change once you're in the arena. Once so you you're going to set your shutter speed. What's that? Once I find a nice ISO, just lock it. Yep. Once you find that kind of highest ISO you're willing to go to. Okay. Maybe even go down a notch from that. Um, and then, yeah, lock it in at that. But then you can set your shutter speed and your aperture and away you go. Great. Can I, um, one more question is just do, am I focusing yeah. kind of like on the, like the center, which would be the saddle or the person or the horse's eyes? Um, so that kind of depends. I mean, am I, am I gonna get the horse and the person Kind of clear if we the... have a large enough aperture, you should be fine. So if okay. you're at like a five six or an f eight, uh, that should be enough depth of field there that the horse can be in focus, the rider can be in focus. You're not going to have okay. an issue. Uh, if we start shooting at like a two eight, then we might run into an area where like their near shoulder is sharp. Right. Right. But by the time I get to their nose, it's a little soft. Okay. So um, it seems you know. Kind of, especially for you, it seems like more of an extra obstacle because we're cutting out some more light yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's going to give you that depth of field. We just need to rely on that ISO to come up and help you out a little bit more. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. 
So for indoors light source, a lot of times I try and shoot, if I can, uh, early morning light or late evening light coming in through windows. Uh, it's just a really beautiful light source that comes in. If you don't have that opportunity, um, you can fake it. And like I said, I would get LED lights and then you can actually get colored gels for them. So you can get some that are like a full shade of orange or you can get them in, they call them uh, CTO, but you can get them in like quarter and half shades of that same orange. So you can kind of mimic that warmer evening and uh, morning sunlight and use that. But I would use it as a constant LED light. Like I said before, if you use strobes, that pulse of light and then also that pop that the lights make when they're going off is going to cause fear in the animal typically. Uh, the more you do it, the more used to it they get, but it's going to be a long, long time before they're just fine with it typically. So LED lights and then play with some of the uh, correction gels to change that color so you can warm it up a little um, or you can leave it as just a bare white light too if you prefer but little subtle touch of warmth usually makes it look more natural. Yeah, so uh, if I have, so the best way to do this is if you um, have an assistant. So if I've got either the owner or if I am uh, at home and I can have my wife help me out. So basically I'll go on one side of the yard, she'll go on the other side of the yard. And if they'll chase a ball or something like that, I'll usually have them throw the ball towards me. And then I can get the dog running straight at that ball. Um, again, for that, we're going to want to go with a higher shutter speed because we're typically trying to freeze action there. So I'm going to probably, I would say on the slow side, probably a 500th of a second, but you're probably going to want to actually be closer to like a thousandth of a second to really freeze them in place when they're running. Uh, definitely burst mode. I want to get as many shots out of that each run as I can. Um, and then for that focusing, I want to have it in AFC, so it's continuous autofocus. Uh, that way, as soon as I engage focus with them, the camera is going to refocus even as I'm shooting. So I'm going to have more keepers out of that run. Uh, and then for me, a lot of times that focus area, I will set to be a, uh, uh, I'm blanking on the name now, that I, I want to have it be on that expanded uh, area. Uh, what's it called here? Flexible spot. Yeah, expanded flexible spot. I love that. Mode. Yep. That way I'll have that focus point, but then the anchor points around it. So it'll help uh, hold quite a bit better. And if you want uh, with the newer cameras, like the 7.3, R3, all of those guys, uh, if you want to use animal eye autofocus, I can show you guys here if you haven't found where that is. The trade off is I can't use tracking autofocus area with it so i can either use animal eye or i can use that tracking piece um, so and if we go into our menu oops i'm going to move chat out of the way here real quick there we go so as we go into our menu in that first camera tab you will have your Oops, I went past it here. Yeah, so we'll have, so this is on an R4 that I'm on right now. Um, I want to say on like a, no, it'll be page six on like an A7 III and whatnot too. Uh, but you'll have that face IAF settings. And when I click into there, I'll have subject detection. And I can toggle between animal and human. And a lot of times this is something that I will save on my function button so that if I want to adjust it, I can actually save it right on here. So let's say you never used your flash, I can save it in that spot instead. So it's just quicker for me to get to.
but when I have the, that piece enabled, so let's go to animal. Now when I go to function and I go to my focus area, I can't use tracking. So it's kind of one or the other. So I'd play around with them, see which one you have better results with. Uh, a lot of times, the IAF works really well, but if it has trouble seeing both eyes, it doesn't want to really engage sometimes. So a lot of times I still stick with uh, having my tracking autofocus piece on. Um, so, Having the horses with a dark background, uh, so just the horses lit. So it's there's kinda, two ways you can it, do about it. Uh, one is uh, using lighting, uh, which I'm guessing is probably not allowed. Um, and then, yeah, the other would probably be to add, to do it in Photoshop. Uh, but I've a lot tried, of times people will, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I've tried using um, like speed lights inside the barn but I'm not yep. sure do I want to do it at night when the rest of the barn is black. It never came out good because you could either see parts of the, the stall behind it or, you know, I don't really sure. don't know where to put him, but yeah, no, I can get close. I can put him in a barn and I'm, I'm just not too sure. And everyone's telling me now that you really got to use Photoshop, but I was like, I feel like I could do it. But. Oh no, no, you can do this with lighting. Um, so are these more posed shots or are these movement it's shots? Yeah, real common pose shots. People, the owners like to have a portrait of the horse and that's what they want is it's like just the horse coming out of a dark background. Okay. Um, so this is something that a lot of times I do, um, not with horses. This is actually a lot of what I do with, if I'm gonna do macro stuff inside the house, then I wanna photograph uh, flowers inside my house, but I don't want you to see the kitchen in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, so this will be uh, basically just setting my, um, you're gonna end up probably dropping your ISO down a bit lower and you're gonna end up uh, dropping your, or pushing your shutter speed up as high as you can go. So what we're gonna try and do is cut out as much of that ambient light as we can get. Okay. And so that just that studio strobe is really the main light source. Okay. Um, one of the easier ways to probably do this is even as you're looking on the back of the camera, before you have the flash mounted or turned on, uh, or before I have the studio lights kind of reading into the camera, uh, adjust it so that everything almost looks too dark, like everything looks black. Okay. And then when that light goes off, it's going to fill in the horse, uh, or uh -huh. it's going to fill in the rider and the horse. Right. Uh, but that way you'll have the background will be black and the really the only light source coming in is going to be from that uh, studio strobe or the flash or what have you. So I assume you're talking about a, a small aperture as well? Yep, so we're going to probably go to 5.6 or f8, um, whatever we can do to cut out as much light. Yeah. And then your flash, a lot of times I'll run that on manual and mm -hmm. you're going to probably shoot that at like half power. So it's going to put out quite a bit of light uh, it's going to take it a moment to kind of resync and get going again, but okay. but yeah, right. it'll be your main light source, and then the camera itself, between the lens and the ISO and everything, will cut out as much of that ambient light as possible. And this I could do like in the daytime. Yeah, yeah. Oh. A lot of times okay. I'll shoot. Like I said, I do this a lot for photographing flowers and in, inside the house. You can do it yeah. in the middle of the day. You just need to be able to cut out enough light. And your background on your flowers will be dark? Yep, it'll be black. Oh, cool. Oh, so I could try in the house before at the bar. Yep, so you can experiment a bit in the house, too, uh, and kind of get a feel for it. Great, thank you. Yep.